our opening session, I felt it appropriate to read the scripture, Romans 10, starting with verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. And that is why we're here. That is why we're here, to gain knowledge of God, to accompany our zeal. Let us go to the throne of grace. Father in heaven, we thank you for allowing us the opportunity to gather together, Lord, and study your word. Lord, we pray that your word touches our hearts and touches our minds and touches our souls and we'll be better than when we came. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise. And Lord, we ask that a special prayer on Sister Versailles Johnson. We don't know the the increase in increase in a ooh, can't see speak now. We don't know the situation, but you know the situation. Lord, just intervene. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please join me as we open up with blessed assurance.
way down on the keyboard for you guys. I can't hear it. Can you guys hear it? Okay, all right, just making sure, as long as you guys can hear it. This song is simple, I know you guys know it too. Thank you, Lord. church say amen say amen again put your hands together for our ministry of music how y'all doing welcome back i said welcome back let's loosen up a little bit i haven't spoken to some of you let's stand go find three people that you haven't spoke to that means you didn't drive with them and say welcome back
All right, get back to your seats now. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come this evening to thank you for yet another expression of your goodness. You've been good and you've been merciful to us. And for that, we say thank you. We thank you for bringing us from the earliest of this morning to the twilight of this evening. And God, as we have assembled uh, to regroup once again to study your word, Lord, we ask, first of all, that you would forgive us of our sins. Create within us a clean heart and renew the right spirit within us. Holy Spirit, it's your time. God, we ask that you would open our hearts up that we might be both receptive and responsive to your word for the living out of these days. For that, we give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said amen. Won't you stand with me for the reading? of the word are we ready I can't hear nobody <laughs> aim fire this is my Bible there are many like it but this one is mine it is my weapon it is my road map in enemy country in my Bible is found the plan of salvation Romans 10 and 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It is by our humility towards our Christ, hospitality within our congregation, hard work within our community that the unsaved would be. Now put your hands together for that because y'all memorize that. And that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Sit down, sit down, sit down. I want to take a little different approach to, uh, today. Uh, Shanika, first slide. Chicka, 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 first slide. Amen. I want to take a little different approach of this, and I want to talk about uh, the characteristics of a five-star church. The characteristics of a five-star church. And un underneath that, you can't see it, but it says, share Jesus now. Next slide. Share Jesus now. Um, what it says under that is what congregational evangelism should look like at Calvary Baptist Church. Next slide. Acts 3, 1 and 9. I'm going to ask you to remain seated tonight. I'm going to read this into your hearing, and then we'll go from there. But turn with me to the Acts of the Holy Spirit, chapter number 3. And when you get there, say amen. If you're not there, you're in the right place. And I want to focus tonight on verses 1 through 9. Acts is right after the Gospel of John. I'm sorry, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Yeah, after John. Chapter number 3, verse 1 says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple of the hour at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seen Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alm. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give, unto, uh, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. 
Amen, amen, and amen. Let me talk a little bit about this characteristics of a five-star church and put a subtitle on it. Just look at your neighbor and say, share, share. Jesus, Jesus now. I've got handouts for you, but I don't want to give them to you now because I don't want you looking at them. And so I'll give them to you at the end of the lecture. The first century church was much different than our modern day church. The early Christian lives revolved around the activities of the church. In our passage, we have this story of Peter and, and John. Peter was a motivator. John was a mystic. They were exact opposites in each other, in each profile. And if you kind of follow the relationship between Peter and John, they really kind of got on each other's nerves. Uh, they were kind of like oil and water. In John 21, uh, Peter, Jesus is saying to the disciples that all of the disciples would experience a death for witnessing about Jesus Christ. But he didn't mention John. And Peter was the one that said, well, what about him? What's going to happen to him? Jesus said, don't worry about him. He's going to have him do what I have him to do. Peter was aggressive, outspoken, and daring. But John was soft with a gentle spirit. Although different, they are seen walking to church together. To pray and to worship together. It's the ninth hour, and that's critical because that's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, which was the hour of sacrifice. That's the same time that Jesus gave up the ghost on the cross of Calvary, Matthew 27, verse 45 and 46. As Peter and John approached the gate of the temple, they're going to church together. They heard some expressions coming from this gentleman who's been set at the temple steps. Can you spare some change? Can you help a brother out? Can you help a brother out a little spare change? And Peter, fascinating his eyes on the lame man, says, silver and gold have I none. But that which I do have, I'm going to share it with you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I command you, Rise and walk. Now, let's, let's look a bit, little bit about this man. He's, he's not no baby. Scripture says he's been lame since birth. And Acts 40 says he's 40 years old. And so for 40 years, atrophy has set in his legs and his feet. His muscles have withered. He's had somebody bring him to the temple every day day. And when you think about it, that's kind of smart. I mean, if you need some help, what better place to get help than to lay me at the temple? I remember, I might have shared this story with you once before. Um, I was leaving church on 79th Street in Chicago. I got down the street and um, there was this guy on the corner begging for alms. And so when he got to my car, uh, I said, man, I, I, all I got is a $20 bill. He said, what would Jesus do? <laughs> <laughs> and so I felt guilty. I went across the street to the gas station to get change. And I made a U-turn. I got to the light. It was a red light. He was still on the other side of the street. And I was watching him. He reached in his pocket and pulled out a lot of money and was counting it. I just thought I'd tell you that story. And so what better place? He said he knew I was coming from church. I had on church clothes. And so, Christian, let me see Jesus. And so he's asking for money, but Peter quickly dismantles his hope of financial gain when he says, silver and gold have I none. Such as I have, I give unto you, I give you Jesus. Uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise, pick up your bed and your, stand up and walk. Then Peter takes the man by the right hand, say right hand, and he lifts him up. He assisted the man to get on his feet, and the Bible says it happened immediately. His feet and ankle bones received strength. He leaped up and stood to his feet and now walked. 
Now he is no longer lying on the outside of the temple, but he's walking into the temple, leaping and praising God. That's a good place to say amen right there. All the people were amazed and filled with awe. Peter and John now have an audience and proceed to preach about Jesus Christ being crucified, buried, and resurrected from the dead. Dear Calvary, consider these few details about the first century church. First slide. They went to church to pray. Look at somebody and say, they went to church to pray. Next slide. Next slide. One more slide. Now consider this. It is the privilege of every believer to assemble with other like-minded believers to agree in the power of prayer. Peter and John came together despite their personality differences. They knew when they got into the house of the Lord or the house of prayer, they had a common interest. They didn't have no money. But they had, but they came to church because the church is where we touch and agree on the issues of life. The church is the information depot for the lost soul and the watershed for the weary traveler. They did not embrace that erroneous belief that we can stay home and have church. I can't hear nobody. Church life was too vital for their spiritual formation. And I believe that there's some witnesses in here that can thank God for a praying church. That someone is praying on your behalf. The Hebrew writer says, let us forsake not the assembling. Come on and help me out of ourselves together. Next slide. So Peter, and here's, here's the instance of the power of prayer in the church. You know the story, Acts 12, that Peter was in prison uh, he was about to be killed. But the church had a prayer meeting at Sister Mary's house. And they was praying for Peter. Lord, please, the Lord, deliver Peter from locked in jail. Ooh, Lord. So in the middle of their prayer, uh, angel comes down. You know the story. Don't make me tell the whole thing. And uh, Peter is chained. He's in chains and he's asleep. And, and that's another thing. That's another sermon right there. Peter's in jail and he's about to be killed, but he has so much faith in God that he goes to sleep. That's the kind of faith that I want. That I don't have to worry about some of the stuff that I worry about. Angel comes, lets him loose, and he's walking. He realizes now the angel has freed him. The church has prayed for him. And the first thing he does is he goes to Sister Mary's house. He knocks on the door where the prayer meeting is. He knocks on the door, and a little girl uh, leaves the prayer meeting and goes to see who it is. And she opens the door, and it's Peter. She closed the door. She thought he was a ghost. And she went back to the prayer meeting. She said, guess who I was outside knocking on the door? Peter. They were praying for Peter, and the Lord heard their prayer. Next slide. God expects us to come to church and pray. Somebody say amen. Next slide. All right. Um, they shared Jesus with others. First century church, they shared Jesus with others. When they encountered the lame man, they gave him no money. And Peter says, such as I have, I give unto you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Nazareth, rise up and walk. Jesus was their everything. And that's what they shared. They did not have money, but they had Jesus. And they shared Jesus. They shared Jesus as a way of life. I, I'm, I'm sure that the apostles were prayed up. I'm sure they spent much time seeking the Lord. They was going to pray some more. But when this man presented them with his need, they didn't feel the need to pray right then and there. They simply brought him his healing in Jesus' name. Next slide. Therefore, go make disciples 
of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son. And, and we, we, we started to recite this every Sunday morning because I want us to get it in our minds and our hearts, just what the mission of the church is. Next slide. Next slide. Sharing Jesus with one another. Next slide. The church has a mandate to share Jesus now. Look at somebody and say, the church has a mandate to share Jesus now. Next slide. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit. What was it that gave Peter and John such power? These fishermen. Hillbilly homespun fishermen, blue-collar workers from Galilee, but yet they had the power to see this man rise up and walk at the name of Jesus. Acts, I like to call it, you know, some people call it the Acts of the Apostles, but I call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit because whatever the Apostles did, they did it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts is the story of men and women who took the commission and their commitment seriously and began to share the news of a risen Savior. It is the account of the beginning of Christ's church and a tremendous church growth. In Acts 1 and 8, it says, And you shall receive power after that which is the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. Listen! It says, You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and after you receive power, you shall be witnesses. Let me push pause and rewind again. You shall receive power. And that power is not given for you to holy dance, run around the church, how you can speak in tongue and cuss your neighbor out in English. The Holy Spirit gives us power for one thing, to witness about Jesus Christ. In Acts 1 and 8, they were promised power. In Acts 2, they received power. In Acts 3, they're now demonstrating the power. Say this after me. God has given the church power to witness to the unsaved about Jesus Christ. Next slide. What does that say? <laughs> okay. That's what I just said, right? All right. Next slide. Oh, okay, stay right there. Let me read this, this little letter that I wrote. Uh, I've had the privilege of taking the gospel to various parts of the country. In my travels, I have had the opportunity to stay in some top hotels and some hotels that were less desirable. I have noticed that the top hotels work hard at customer satisfaction. And as a result, many people return to get more of the same treatment that they received on the first visit. As a result of tremendous effort, presentation, and collaboration on the part of top-notch hotels, many have received what is called a five-star rating. Five-star means that they offer a superior service. They received five stars because what they presented was that which was appealing and attractive. And I can hear somebody thinking, so let me add this narrative right here. The church should never take less pride in their work than any secular entity. One man had a mission to invent a soft drink called Coca-Cola. His mission was to market Coca-Cola all over the world. And you can now go to the most remote parts of the world and people are drinking Coca-Cola. Kingdom business is far more vital than any corporation or organization. As a matter of fact, the church is not an organization, it's an organism. When people come to Calvary Baptist Church, they're looking for something. Say amen if you can. When they come, they're looking for some. Might, might be looking for this. Somebody might be looking for that. People are looking for something. And the church of Jesus Christ should be no less serious, neither successful, than any secular entity presenting Christ than the world is presenting cons consumerism. What made the early church prosper and be successful? How was the gospel able to reach so many people. How did the church grow from 12 to 120 to 5,000 
to over 9,000 or 10,000 in chapter 9. I want to look at the characteristics of a five-star church based off this text. The text shows us a five-star church. I'm going to give you these five uh, characteristics, then we'll all be through. Next slide. A church in agreement to show others a better life. A five-star church is a church that's in agreement to show others a better life. Am I right there? And so in order for a church to be in agreement to show others a better life, there has to be some cooperation. Peter and John were in cooperation. A five-star church will not, will not allow disagreements to affect the overall mission of the church. Preach, man. I'm going to say that again. A five-star church would not allow disagreements to affect the overall mission, thank you, of the church. We may not agree on everything, Calvary, but there are some things that we must agree on. We must agree on the mission, the message, and the method of ministry. Acts 2 and 44 says, and all that believed were together and all had things in common. They went together because they knew they, that we need each other. I need you. You need me. We need each other. Ubuntu to survive. Many Christians have been, in, in, have been infected with what sociologist Robert Bella calls radical individualism. Mm. They concentrate on personal obedience to Christ. As if all that matters is Jesus, me, my family, my wife, my son, my daughter, my dog, Biff, us for no more. But in doing so, you miss the point altogether. Most people join churches because they want to be a part of a healthy movement where people can work together. What keeps them coming are friendships that foster inward awareness and support. Amen, amen. The second characteristic of a five-star church, next slide, is a church that promotes a quality relationship with God. That's meditation. Say meditation. Peter and John were going to pray. A five-star church, church promotes a prayer life. Why? Because prayer promotes four things. It promotes, first of all, a relationship with God. Our Father, which art in heaven. It promotes restoration from God. Give us this day our daily bread. It didn't say give me enough strength, enough bread to make it through the week. He said give me the strength that I need to make it on today. When the children of Israel were in the wilderness, God didn't give them fresh bread to last for the week. He gave it to them day by day. And when we're talking about prayer, that's restoration. That's plugging into the power source with God. A church that does not pray has lost its power. And a church that ceases to pray ceases to become the church. Because our power comes in, in prayer. I've said it before that uh, prayer is like plugging into the power source. And when you don't plug into the power source, your conversation sounds like that phone that's battery is weak. Beep. Beep. I'll let you think about that for a little while. Prayer. Let me just revisit this one time. It, it's about our relationship with God. It's about our restoration from God. It's about reconciliation with God. Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And then prayer is about revelation from God. Anybody need God to show them something? Anybody need direction from God? How do you think you get it? It's part of prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Sometimes you don't know where temptation is. But you're saying, Lord, lead me not. Reveal unto me. Not where to go, not what to do. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Acts 12 again, 
King Herod stretched forth his hand to vex the church. He kills James, the brother of John. He sought also Peter. And I told you what happened. The church prayed for him. They need, people need to be encouraged by prayer. The third characteristic of the church, next slide. A church where Jesus is the main attraction. I'm going to say that again. A church where Jesus is the main attraction. Say, say presentation. I want to add to that presentation that exceeds expectations. Five-star church is, a, is, a, is where Jesus is the main attraction, but the presentation of Jesus expe- exceeds their expectation. Listen, watch this. Watch this. This is a powerful text. The lame man received more than he re- expected from Peter and John. He requested money, but he received Jesus. Every church's identity must present Jesus as the main attraction, must present Jesus as king. The people must be able to see Jesus in the worship experience. Observe the text. Jesus has already been resurrected from the dead. He's not there with them on earth now. He back in heaven. And they say, look on us. For what? Because before the blind man could see Jesus, he would have to see Jesus in them. And for somebody that's unsaved or unchurched, who you might be trying to witness to, before they can see Jesus, they need to see Jesus in you. The best sermon is not the one preached, it's the one lived. It's not how high you jump when you shout. It's how straight you walk when your feet hit the ground. How could the lame man see him? Peter said, look on us. Because the church should be a reflection of Jesus Christ. Jesus must be the main attraction. How we treat one another and visitors on Sundays. Uh Uh-oh. How we treat one another and visitors on Sundays. And after the benediction, will speak volumes of the priority that Jesus has in our lives. When you start inviting folk to church, some of them are going to come. And they might not look like us. They might not be as presentable as you would like them to be. Boy, thank you. I remember once um, in Chicago, uh, I wasn't preaching there, and Liz Derrick, my play godmother, we we were sitting, you know, at the church, uh, we would usually have a 3.30, we would have a 3.30 service, so in between church, you know, we had fried chicken dinners downstairs and all that stuff, and a lot of folk would take their chairs and sit out on the front step of the church and all that stuff like that. We were all out there just clowning, you know, just acting out. And uh, this beggar came by, and he said, can y'all give me some food or some uh, money? Just ignored him. Just ignored him. As he was walking away, Liz said, see you, Jesus. It messed me up. It messed me. Be careful how you treat people. Because you might be entertaining an angel unaware. Now, now, that thing messed me up. It never left me. And I said, now, what if that was Jesus? He came to the church. <laughs> I'm thinking about stories now. Y'all got me on a roll. But no, there's this illustration of a man came to church, was not dressed like everyone else. And uh, I'm going to mess this story up, but I'm going to give it a shot. And uh, he, let me come back to you on that. I'm going to get that story. I'm going to give it back to you because this is a good story. I just want to do it. All right. So um, Jesus needs to be the, the main attraction. Uh, the church should reflect the king of kings as the audience and the attraction. So, so here it is. Do you know when you come to church on Sunday, a lot of times we sit um, and I'm preaching as though you're the audience? That's all wrong. 
You're not the audience. Jesus. Does that make sense to anybody? Jesus is the audience. That kind of ties in with the last one, so I'll come back to that. Put a pin there. Uh, the next slide. A church that inspires the uns- The fourth characteristic of a five-star church is a church that inspires the unsaved. The unsaved to lift their level of living. To lift their level of living. I want that to make sense to you. A church that inspires those, well, let me put it this way, who are unsaved to live a better life. To lift their level of living. A five-star church should inspire people to live better lives. Watch this. In verse 7, Peter took him by the right hand and gave the man a lift. He does not give him money, but he gives him a lift. The church should help lift others, not carry them. Don't miss that. The church should lift others, not carry them. There has to be some desire on the part of the, of, of the individual to want to live a better life. Does that make sense? When the church doors open at Calvary Baptist Church, there is a sea with a wave of stress that enters the sanctuary. I see it on Sunday morning. There's a wave of stress as I look into the eyes of people that are going through stuff. There are people that have been diagnosed with sickness, God help, troubled marriages, and people that have to make major decisions. There are people that come for information and strength about and from God. The church must be in position to be used by the Holy Spirit to assist with the lifting and transformation of lives. There's some things you can't get staying at home. I'm just saying. Here's the last characteristic of a five-star church. A church that rejoices over new life. A church that rejoices over new life. Say celebration. The way you learn to say amen is by saying amen. The way you learn to say hallelujah is by saying hallelujah. Remember I said, as I make reference to that last characteristic, you all are not the audience. God is the audience. The man in this text went from lame to leaping. Did you hear that? He went from lame to leaping. Leaping in context of this text is synonymous to dancing. This man had no other problem but his legs, yet that one problem affected his whole life. His life changed when Jesus was shared with him. A five-star church will celebrate new life in Christ with those whose lives have been transformed by Christ. Whenever one soul joins the church, the church ought to go up in a frenzy. Don't miss this. Peter grabbed them by the right hand. And I know this is a stretch. This is not exegesis. This is what I call eisegesis. I'd like to believe that Peter was giving him the right hand of fellowship. To the church. So it is that he immediately received strength in his feet and ankle bones. He leaped up and stood. Now he's walking inside the church and praising God. Somebody say amen. Amen. There must be some celebration in the church. Church is a place where lives are changed. Verse 9 says that the people saw it and they started praising God. It takes cooperation of everyone to carry out the plan. Rejoice always. In the Lord. Now let's get to the business. Next slide. Simply sharing Jesus. Next slide. Share Jesus now. Say share Jesus now. Next slide. Share Jesus now campaign 2023 will launch on, will be on Sunday. Say Sunday. October 1st, 2023. Now here's the question. How does it work? (laughs) Thank you, (laughs) Amen. Let's go home. <laughs> Next slide. There, 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 let's get right, right. On Sunday and tonight, I was going to wait for Sunday, but thank God Aunt Seal uh, printed the letter out for me tonight. I'm going to give you a letter tonight uh, and also a, a letter on Sunday. And it's simply a letter from me that I want you to give to somebody who is unsaved 
or unchurched. Hear me real good. I'm not talking about somebody that belongs to another church. We don't want to swip fish in the aquarium. I'm talking about somebody that does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ who may be in your home or is unchurched. And the, the letter will simply be an invitation from me and the membership of Calvary, inviting them to church on the 1st of October. And the message will be tailored to teach all that are in attendance that God has a plan for our lives. Next slide. Read the letter and share it with someone who is unsaved or unchurched. That's number two. Next slide. Number three, invite them to church on Sunday, October the 1st, 2023. Next slide. If possible, sit with them that Sunday. Next slide. Are we missing something? Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Let me go back here a second. Uh, hold on a second. We're missing four. Go back to four. Be in prayer. There we go. Be in prayer for that person or persons to, after you give them that letter, you be in prayer. Look at somebody and say, be in prayer. Be in prayer for that person or persons to accept Jesus Christ as Savior. Next slide. If possible, sit with them that Sunday. Next slide. During decision time, lovingly encourage them to accept Christ. Amen. And the very last one, do not force them. Allow the Holy Spirit to do the rest. Next slide. Amen. That's all I got for you tonight. Questions? Ask them now. Don't be asking somebody else after it's over with. Are there any questions tonight? Yes, Brother Russell. So in 2 Timothy, uh, Paul is writing a letter to his son, Timothy, in the faith. And he's encouraging him, encouraging him not to be fearful in the ministry. And he also reminds him that we've laid hands on you, and the same faith that was in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice is also in you. But then he says something very key. He says, stir up the gift. That's within. And the Greek word picture for that is, Flan the flame. There's a light flickering there. And the more you fan the flame, the larger it gets. So you're right. And the Bible does authenticate that once you are saved, God gives you everything you need at that point. But you've got an obligation to develop the gift. You can't just, uh, in spiritual gifts, the process of, of spiritual gifts, the first process in even developing that spiritual gift is the posture of humility. Anybody that God ever used with a great gift, they humbled themselves first, or either he had to humble them for them. Let's consider Moses on the backside of that mountain. Jethro is uh, father-in-law. He's tending the sheep. He's back there, and then this fire catches, this bush catches on fire. Nothing strange about that. It was an arid land, and sometimes bush is caught on fire. But what was different about this one is that it wasn't burning up. So it gets Moses' attention, and then the first thing God tells Moses is, Moses, Moses, and I've told you before, whenever there's, your name is mentioned twice in, in Scripture, the first one is to get your attention. The second one is a warning. He said, Moses, Mo, <laughs> take off your shoes. Have you ever thought about that? Take off your shoes. That's such a menial task. That's small. And I believe that God is saying, in order for me to bless you with the big things, you got to do the small things first. So the posture of humility uh, puts you in position in 
stirring up the gift that God has given to you. But the second one is the principle of availability. A lot of people say, Lord, I want to use this gift. I want this gift to develop in me. But where they at tonight? And I don't care how much ability you have. Your ability without availability is a disability. And you cannot nurture that gift if you're never available to do nothing. Could you teach Sunday school? I'm not teaching no Sunday school. Don't put your head down. Make you look guilty. Can you be a part of this ministry? I don't have time to be a part of that ministry. Please, please, please come to Sunday school. Please come to Bible school. I don't have time. But yet you want to possess power without any availability. The third leg in that race is the picture of creativity. Whatever God gifts you with, Russell, it ain't the same thing he gifted me with. We all got different gifts. We all got different fingerprints. Nobody got the same fingerprints. We might have similar gifts or we might have the same administration or a gift, but God gives it to us in a way that speaks to us creative, creatively. There's no need to be a cheap imitation of anybody else when you could be a first-class presentation of who God has made you to be. Picture of creativity. Now, here's a good way for you to develop that spirit, the Holy Spirit in your life. Pick up responsibility. Do more. And then once you commit to what you say you're going to do, do what you said you're going to do. People stay stuck. They can't grow. Their, their, their spiritual gift can't develop because you say, okay, you want me to lead this ministry? I'm going to lead it. And you don't see them for the next six weeks. Don't y'all throw nothing up here at me now. But yet you want spirit. You want to be strong. I'm always leery of people that are so holy. I'm talking about all of the saints. I'm too stressed to be blessed. You know, God is good all the time. Jump and shout. And then when you get ready to preach, they put up that Baptist finger and walk on out. There's a disconnect there. These, they had power. Russell. Why? Because they was connected to the power source. And so when this man was in need, they said, in the name of Jesus. You know, in biblical times, names denote power. It denotes authority. And so they said, now they were connected. There's another story in Acts 20. I can't remember. The son, seven sons of Sceva. Are you, any of y'all familiar with that story? There were, seven, there, there were seven false prophets that saw Peter and John, or the apostles, casting out demons and... Now, this is, this is first century, so the power that we have now is different from that, all right? Because that was, at that time, it was called the apostolic age, and God was establishing the foundation of the church. So he gave them special power that we don't have now. Not to say that we limit God, God could do anything. But these seven sons of Sceva saw that these apostles were casting out demons and, 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 and performing all these miracles. They said, oh, we could do that. We could do that. And so they start trying to cast out the demons, and they said, in the name of Jesus. And the demon said, say what? In the name of Jesus. They said, now, Paul, we know. And Jesus, we know. But we don't know you. And so they jumped out. <laughs> you read it, some good stories in the Bible. And so them demons, you be careful if there's no connection. So I said to you, Posture of humility. Say posture of humility. The principle of availability. The picture of creativity. Picking up responsibility. And here is the culminating thing. The proof is in your reliability. That's the proof right there. I don't need an alarm clock to get up on Sunday mornings. I know where I'm supposed to be at. I don't want nobody looking and saying, I hope he show up today. You know, he ain't showed up for the first three Sundays. You know, he be tripping. You know he's from Chicago. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes, sir, come on with it, man. Come on with it.
I like what you say about first cousin. I think they're the same family. Because the Bible says unto us, once again, in Timothy, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So that means if God did not give us that spirit, where did it come from? First John 4 opens up by saying, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try it to see that that, that spirit is, is of God. That means that every spirit is not of God. And if it don't line up with this, we got a problem. That's problematic. Next question. I think we've got time for one more then. Come on, Russell. Three times. Three times a charm. No. <laughs> the hypersthetic union. No, the spirit of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are synonymous. So you have what's called, I just said, a hypostatic union. Uh, although Jesus was all man, he's all God. All right? And, you know, I guess some things we'll never fully understand until we get to heaven. But that spirit, one faith, one baptism, one spirit. You want to go for four? He's asking, can I speak to reconciliation when witnessing? Mm -hmm. I think that uh, in particular in, in witnessing, I think that it should be clear uh, that Romans 6 and 23 is clear. For all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans is also true when it says, uh, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So I think we should be clear that no matter how low you've gotten, no matter what you've done, you can't do anything too bad that God will not forgive you outside of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And so when it comes down to the ministry of reconciliation, it's so broad a term. It's not only talking about our relationship with God. It talks about our relationship with one another, being reconciled one to another in Christian love. And we often quote, and I've said it, I'm saying it, I want to say it often as I can because I believe that uh, repetition is good for pedagogy. Uh, we often say that prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And what we're saying in that is God, I'm asking you to forgive me based on how I forgive him. If I can't forgive him, then you're asking God, I want you to forgive me, but I'm not going to forgive. You know what he did to me. Lord said, vengeance is mine. You said, I'm going to give it back to you as soon as I get through with it. It's 8 o'clock, y'all. We got to go. Um, let's stand. Uh, where? Oh, let me give you these handouts before you leave. Brethren, could you help pass? No, I, I, you got two handouts. That's the lesson for tonight. Okay, and that is the letter. So both of you, walk, you, you should walk away with the handout for Share Jesus Now and the lesson for tonight.
Hey, Russell, help, help them hand out some of that stuff. And I'm asking the church to be in prayer with me as we pray for souls to be saved. For souls to be saved. Okay, thank you, Brother Robinson. There are vegetables out in the front for anyone that wants vegetables. Dr. Christie, you want to come say something? Come on, come on. I'm sorry. This week. Oh, thank you. Are we still taping? Are we? Anyway, uh, and I don't have any other announcements other than Brother Bordeaux wants to make sure that you know that his group will meet on Sunday rather than Saturday for the next two weeks. Other group leaders, please raise your hand, facilitators, so we know who to connect with. Is Sister Fryson here? Uh, Brother Stinson? Anyone else? Please join a group. You'll learn lots. Please. You'll have fun. You'll get a chance to know people, and you won't be put on the spot. We won't. Please. We'll make sure you won't do that unless you want to. <laughs> please join a group. Many have asked uh, about my wife. My wife is back in school. And so I ask and solicit your prayers for her uh, as she has class on Tuesday night. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Father, for the lesson. We pray, oh God, that we would have not just been hearers, but that we would have heard it, received it, and apply it to our lives for Christian living. We thank you, Father, for our church family. And we ask, oh God, that you would continue to lead, guide us, and direct us every step of the way. We pray for those who are sick those who are ailing in spirit. We pray for, Father, wherever there's suffering, hurting in the church, or wherever, that you would move by your mighty hand. God, we ask that you would give us a good night's sleep. And if it's your will that we would wake up tomorrow before our feet hit the ground, we'll say thank you, Lord, for the brand new day. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray with thanksgiving. And all of those who love the Lord said amen. amen. They said amen again. Now come on, throw both heads, hands and head back, say it like you really made it. Bye-bye.